chaos. On this episode, we are going to be recapping week 14 and then previewing uh, some gambling stuff for week 15. So let's get right into this stuff. We are going to start with the first game. Uh, we're going to go with Rams versus Raiders. Basically, I'm not too worried about either one of these teams for playoff purposes, but I think I had to bring it up just because of the, the Baker Mayfield comeback. That was an incredible game to watch. A very good Thursday night football game to start the week off. Uh, even though like the matchup, when you know first looked at it, you were like, Ugh, do I even want to really watch that? Baker's only been there for two days. It's probably going to be a complete snooze fest between the two teams, especially considering neither one of them are probably going to make the playoffs here. Uh, but Baker Mayfield made it interesting. Uh, he just made plays when he had to. Drove down the field 98 yards. I think there was a le less than two minutes left in the game. And he got the job done. And so that's going to, you know, obviously get some people's hearts pumping into this next game against the Packers on Monday night, I think it is. Um, you know, otherwise this game would be very, very boring once again. But the fact that Baker is kind of back in the, the forefront of a team now, it's going to be interesting because everybody likes to watch him. He's just a polarizing f figure in the NFL considering his path in the NFL thus far in his career. So that'll be an interesting Monday Night Football game this upcoming week, and we'll get to you know what I think about that gambling-wise later on in the podcast. But just, I just thought I'd point out you know the Baker Mayfield comeback. Everybody's seen it by now, but it was just a very interesting you know outcome for that game. The Raiders lose another game uh, at the very end, basically blow another lead. It's like the fourth one on the season now. So Josh McDaniels is having trouble closing out games as a coach, but we'll see if he can turn that around before the end of the season. Next game, Bills versus Jets. This one was a knockdown, drag out, tough, you know, AFC East matchup, kind of as you would expect. It was rainy slash snowing in uh, Buffalo as they were playing there. And man, the Jets were playing tough. Mike White was doing a decent job. Then he got absolutely speared, uh, had some, you know, rib soreness, pain. Went to the hospital after the game just to check it out, just to make sure he didn't have any breaks or anything like that. So I don't know if we have a full-blown update of that just yet. Uh, but hopefully he can play this next week because, I mean, he's doing just enough to get the, the Jets' offense, you know, over that threshold of just, like, way mediocre as what it was earlier in the season. Uh, he's getting the ball out of his hands to his playmakers, and that's making that offense good considering how good the Jets' defense is. And they just need to balance each other out, and they are a good playoff team going forward. Uh, the Bills, though, they get the job done in this one. The offense for the Bills has looked a little bit suspect the last couple weeks. They're not really clicking on all cylinders right now. Uh, Stephon Diggs is obviously a good player, but we're seeing some of the you know, deficiencies in some of those weapons that the Bills have. And everybody thought going into the season that you know, Gabriel Davis is going to take that next step, and he hasn't really shown out. Then they have that crazy rotation of like the exact same football players when it comes to the running back rotation, which is Devin Singletary, James Cook, Naheem Hines. They're all the exact same type of player. So, and I, I always thought it was weird that they traded from Naheem Hines, uh, you know, traded Zach Moss and Zach Moss never really did anything in Buffalo, but he at least was a, a different change of pace type of back. He was a bigger guy. Um, so I don't know. It's a, their offense is a little weird. Dawson Knox is up and down. And it's basically just Josh Allen, please do anything to get us a win here. And it's, I don't think moving forward, going through the AFC playoffs, that's going to be super sustainable if the offense is too Josh Allen centric. And yeah, I know he's like a superhero and he can get it done a lot of times, but that's going to put a lot of pressure on him. He's been running the ball a lot more often as of late, and that's never a good you know outcome because, I mean, any given Sunday he can – take a hit and be concussed and miss a game, and that could happen in the playoffs. So going forward, we have to keep an eye on the Bills' offense. The Bills' defense played well against the Jets here. Even though they were without Von Miller for the rest of the season, uh, I think they can be very competitive on defense all season. Uh, but the reason they brought in Von Miller was to kind of be that closer. Uh, he was the guy that you would think, you know, in the AFC playoffs, if they're in the AFC championship game against, you know, either the Bengals or maybe the Chiefs, that he's the guy that will eventually wrap up a Pat Mahomes or a Joe Burrow and take him down for a game ceiling sack, something along, along those lines. But really without him, they don't have that, that closer type of edge rusher. And so it's interesting to see going forward if somebody can step up there like a Greg Rousseau. Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll see if they can put something together. Let's go to the next game, though. We got Bengals versus Browns in this one. 
Uh, obviously, the Bengals got the job done here. They were without T. Higgins because he re-aggravated a hamstring injury in warm-ups. So he played like one snap, which screwed a lot of people in fantasy, unfortunately, uh, including myself. And also on prize picks because uh, they didn't consider it a DNP. So I, I thought he was going to at least get that and it was going to, you know, give me some leeway there. But didn't happen either. And then Tyler Boyd left the game very early with a dislocated finger. Uh, so it made the weaponry for Joe Burrow very lackluster. He had Jamar Chase still, obviously. Um, and then, you know, his, I guess, Hayden Hurst was still there. Joe Mixon was still in there. But they got the job done. They got creative on offense and figured out a way to get get the win. The Browns are still trying to find their footing with Deshaun Watson as the head or the head coach, as the quarterback now. Um I don't know. I think by the end of the season, maybe that he gets into a little bit more of a rhythm. I, I would expect, I mean, considering he he was he hadn't played football in two straight years, essentially. So uh, the more playing time he gets, obviously, the better he's going to end up being. Uh, he made some bad decisions in this. And, you know, he's still trying to catch up to the NFL speed again because of, you know, obviously the, the lack of playing time the last couple of years. Um, but I think he's figuring some things out. I think he's figuring out that he can really trust Donovan Peoples-Jones. He can trust David Njoku. Obviously, that run game is still going to be good, but you got to be competitive in these games and stay, you know, in these games for the run game to continue to be successful and effective because Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt both are very good players. It's just a matter of if you can keep up in the games where, you know, running the ball is still effective and efficient for the offense. So, Bengals, they are still on the outside looking in when it comes to the uh, AFC North. The Ravens are still atop that division right now uh, based on a win that they just got, and I'll get to that in a little bit here. Uh, but let's go to the next game, Cowboys versus Texans. This game was way closer closer than people were expecting. I mean, the line was 16, I think maybe even 16 and a half by the time the game, you know, the game started. Uh, so a lot of people were saying, you know, bet the, the, <laughs> the Texans because of just the crazy amount of points there. And, like, a lot of people probably didn't take that very seriously. Uh, especially considering Brandon Cooks and Nico Collins were both out in this game. Uh, Derek Stingley for the defense did not play. He's an, a very good rookie cornerback they drafted in the first round, I think fifth overall. And, man, uh, the Texans came out and they were competitive. They had this weird, like, carousel of quarterbacks coming in and out. They had, I think at one point they had J Jeff Driscoll and Davis Mills and maybe even Kyle Allen got some snaps too. It was really weird what they were doing on offense just to see if they could – find somebody. I mean, Jeff Driscoll, I feel like gives him the best upside because he can make some, some throws. Uh, he's not the best passer of the football, but he has the athleticism and the running ability uh, that they kind of wanted to see if he could spark something on the offense. And he kind of did a little bit there. Uh, he was throwing to uh, more. Uh, this dude is showing up whenever he needs to. I mean, he played a, a big role in a, in a game against the Eagles early in the season on Thursday night football. He had a pretty decent game there. And then again, against uh, another NFC East team in the Cowboys here. And the Texans keep it really, really close. Really, they should have won the game. Uh, they had a, <laughs> basically a game-winning interception uh, late in this game, I think with five or four or five minutes left in the game. Should have sealed the deal. They get down there. It's fourth and goal. They don't QB sneak it. I don't really understand this. It's fourth and one. Literally, all you need is one yard. Just try the QB sneak. And if you don't get it, then you're they're on the half yard line, essentially. So they try to run the ball. Doesn't work. Cowboys stop them. Cowboys get the momentum with that. Run all the way back down the field, like 98 yards or whatever it was, and score the game-winning touchdown. Uh, the Texans really blew this game. I don't know if it was a matter of, the, you know, they were like, uh, we showed out, we showed that we can beat the Cowboys, we are still tanking, or it's just they're that inept, and that's why they're 1-10-1. and one. I don't know what the actual you know thought process was there. Uh, it could be really either one, so we'll just leave that up to interpretation by whoever may want to think about that in the, in the you know future. But uh, Texans are still not very good. Cowboys are still rolling, keeping the pressure on the Eagles for that one seed. Uh, I was really hoping the Texan would, Texans would win this game so it would give the Eagles a little bit more breathing room, but didn't happen, so the Eagles just got to keep competing. All right, next game we have the Lions versus the Vikings. The Lions come out, and they are firing on all cylinders right now. Jamison Williams gets his first touchdown as a you know NFL player. 
Long bomb from Jared Goff. DJ Chark playing very well. Amon Ross St. Brown playing well. You got DeAndre Swift back and healthy and playing well again. And then, obviously, you have, like, Jamal Williams. The Detroit defense is doing just enough right now to stop, you know, some of the offenses they've been playing. They didn't do a whole lot in the passing game here, stopping uh, the connection of Kirk Cousins and Justin Jefferson as he had 223 yards on the day, which is impressive and very good for fantasy if you have him. So uh, somebody was a happy camper this week. But, I mean, the Vikings, man, they as we, we've been saying here, it's just they've they've won way too many one-score games. They're 9-0 and in one-score games. They're still 9-0 and in one-score games because they got beat by double digits in this one. Um, and I just, it's just, they're just not a, a sustainable team in general. They just, I don't know. I don't even know how to really describe it. It's just the fact that they target Justin Jefferson too much. They put too much pressure on him and Kirk Cousins to make plays happen. They really can't run the ball very well. Their defense is opportunistic, but not very good. Uh, they have some savvy players in the secondary who make plays every once in a while, but that's not super sustainable either. If you're just completely relying on them to cover forever uh, because the the Vikings D-line is just okay really and their line, linebackers are are getting older and they're just kind of okay as well they're middle of the road so it's uh it's it's kind of scary hours right now for Vikings for the Vikings and Vikings fans alike because of the fact that they are showing some some signs of weakness here going into the playoff and the, the home stretch here going into the playoffs so they look like a very beatable team right now even though they're still atop that NFC um I don't know man and then the Lions they are they basically control their own dis destiny here they can win out and make the playoffs which would be super cool I really kind of want to see that I don't really want to see it considering a team being that hot going into the playoffs and then playing a team like the the Eagles maybe in the first round of the playoff like you never know man it's any given Sunday the NFL's crazy Crazy things can happen. The Eagles played the Lions week one, and that was a very competitive game. So I I feel like Detroit right now, especially if they you know kind of win out or somehow sneak into the playoffs, they're going to be a hot team, and nobody's going to want to play them in the NFC. Next game, Eagles-Giants. Man, this was a performance that I did not see coming. I thought the Eagles would win and cover, uh, but the Eagles absolutely stomped the Giants out. It was an impressive win. I mean, I just keep saying it over and over again. I feel like I'm just on repeat. It's every week now that Jalen Hurts is proving himself. The defense is playing well. The defense finally got their run game or their yeah their rush defense you know together uh, with the combination of Linval Joseph and Nadamik and Sue. Uh, Jordan Davis is back, but he's not fully back. He's still kind of uh, got that ankle, but he's been in and out of there right now. And I think they're just kind of putting him on limited snaps just to make sure he's going to be healthy for the playoff run, considering they have so much depth now on the D-line. Uh, Fletcher Cox looks so much better now that Sue and Linval are there because of the fact that he gets a rest more often than he was. Uh, and that's just going to make the whole D-line fresher going into the playoffs. And that is a recipe for disaster for other uh, NFC offenses, considering if you have a healthy, fresh legs D line especially with the depth we have at D tackle and D end right now that is going to be very very hard to stop going into the playoffs as well as the fact that we have very good coverage corners so it's a matter of I mean right now we're we're getting banged up in the safety area uh, where CJ Gardner Johnson goes down and then we replace him with Reed Blankenship Reed Blankenship gets hurt in this game uh, supposedly it's not Super serious, so that's nice. But C.J. Gardner-Johnson, I think, is scheduled to come back after the Cowboys game because he's on IR. So it's basically just waiting through this you know, safety injury bug we got going on right now to see if we can get fully healthy by the time the playoffs roll around. Have a very um, competitive game coming up on, well, obviously on Sunday. Got to win against the Bears. But then you have the game against the Cowboys on Christmas Eve, that's going to be a huge matchup. That's going to mean a ton of things as long as both teams, the Cowboys and the Eagles, win this next game up on their schedule. Uh, that can come down to some very, very pivotal you know, moments in the NFC playoff picture, depending on who wins and loses that game on Christmas Eve. Let's go to the next game, Ravens versus the Steelers. 
I said it on the last podcast when we were doing the gambling prediction. I had a weird feeling that the the Ravens were going to win this game outright. They were underdogs, and they pulled it out, uh, even though there was you know the injury, obviously, to Lamar Jackson. Tyler Huntley was in this game. Tyler Huntley gets injured in this game, and the Ravens still figure out a way to pull it out. Their run game uh, presented a problem for the Steelers in this one. J.K. Dobbins had a good game. So it was nice to see him back, even though on one of his runs, his, his leg looked a little bit gimpy. So I hope for his sake that he like can continue to get more and more healthy and he doesn't really push it to where like his knee buckles again. Uh, that would be very unfortunate. So looking forward, I hope J.K. Dobbins stays healthy uh, just for you know his sake. But yeah, Ravens get a big win here. Keeps them atop the NFC or NFC. AFC North, and uh, that's going to be a huge deal going forward because if they can, you know, wade through this terrible injury bug they got going on right now uh, and get Lamar Jackson back to, I don't know if he's ever going to get back to 100% health this season with that knee injury, uh, but if he can be 80, 85%, that's probably good enough to make some noise in the playoffs potentially. So moving forward, that was a huge win for the Ravens. Bengals are, you know, breathing down their neck right now. They just keep winning. So we'll see how that turns out. I think probably by the end of this, the Bengals will steal the AFC North from the Ravens. But it's you never know. The AFC North is a tough division, and crazy things happen in that division. So next game, we have the Jaguars versus the Titans. I was way off on this one. I thought the Titans were going to come out pissed off that they lost so badly to the Eagles and just, you know, just d- destroy a division rival. Uh, I thought Derrick Henry was going to have a very big game. I said that in the last podcast, and he did. He had 98 yards, I think, in the first quarter or something like that, rushing. Uh, but it just it didn't really matter because at the end of the day, Trevor Lawrence was just having a, an incredible game. So he was doing very impressive things. Uh, still, I mean, he, he gives like off the aura of Justin Herbert at times. Like He's getting to that level because he has the arm talent. He has the athletic ability. It's just him putting it together, and I think Doug Peterson is really helping him get there to the next level. And I think next year he's going to be a hot, you know, commodity when it comes to fantasy because I think people are going to expect him to take that like that supposed second year jump. I know this is his second year in the league, but I mean, I don't even count what happened in his rookie year because of how stupid Urban Myers is. So we're not even going to count that. I think he's going to get his second year jump in his third season with Doug Peterson as the head coach because he is a quarterback whisperer if anybody is. Next game, we have the Chiefs versus the Broncos. This game was way more competitive than I was expecting. The Chiefs jumped out to a decent little lead there. And then Russell Wilson actually probably had his best game of the season. He was throwing the ball pretty well. He was targeting Jerry Judy, who ended up having three touchdowns on the day. He was running the ball and screaming the ball quite a bit, which eventually got him hurt. He got concussed. But I think that's what the formula for the Broncos should be moving forward is just Russell needs to make the throws when they're there, scramble when he needs to. I feel like that was one of the things he's been doing this year that or that he hasn't been doing this year that he had been in the past where – you know, if nothing's there, he just would scramble, you know, get some yardage, slide, you know, get out of the way, don't get hit. Uh, and he did that in this game until, unfortunately, he did get hit. Um, but, I mean, that's just football, unfortunately. But the Denver offense actually looked kind of decent for a little while there. And the Kansas City defense was letting up points. And, I mean, at the end of the day, Patrick Mahomes got the, the job done. I know he threw three picks in this game. He made another incredible highlight worthy throw in this game where he was running laterally to the sideline and then just flipped the ball over to Jarek McKinnon uh, like it was nothing. And Jarek McKinnon obviously finished the run uh, or finished the pass with a touchdown, which was very impressive. And I'm very mad that I did not start him in fantasy. He was chilling on my bench. That's neither here nor there. But yeah, Chiefs get the job done. They keep winning. Uh, They're atop the AFC right now and they look poised to stay there. There's not a whole lot of teams that are really like in competition with them. I mean, I know, I say that. I mean, the Bills and the and the Bengals right now are they're, they're the top three teams, uh, and the Bengals and Bills both have beat the Chiefs right now. I just don't know if what either one of those teams is doing is sustainable. Really, I don't know if any three of the teams, you know, the Chiefs, Bengals, or the Bills, what they're doing is super sustainable. But I mean, you just have to give them the benefit of the doubt because of their quarterback play. I mean, between Mahomes. Allen and Burrow, you just have to trust what they can do when it comes to the playoffs. So it's going to be a very interesting AFC playoffs this year, especially if all three of those teams still get in. 
Moving forward, uh, Panthers Seahawks. Man, this was disappointing. I have picked this. I've been on this like Seahawks bandwagon for a little while now when it comes to betting and stuff like that. I thought they were a good team, and they just keep letting me down. Uh, the the defense just isn't very good uh, stopping the run. So if they can't, if the Seahawks don't jump out to a lead, the defense isn't very effective because really they want to just be able to rush the passer and play coverage and. That's not what happens whenever Geno Smith is throwing interceptions uh, very early on in the game and putting them, you know, behind the eight ball essentially. So it was a it was a rough outing for Geno and that team. Carolina Panthers get a win. Sam Darnold with a beard is undefeated, so that's impressive. (laughs) I'm glad he's uh, growing some facial hair and and growing some some nads so he can uh, go out there and sling the football and be the player that he was drafted to be in the NFL. So he's been pretty impressive, actually, the first two games of the season. So, or first two games of his season, I should say. And I mean, the Carolina Panthers at this point control their own destiny. Uh, if they continue to win, they still have the Saints and the Buccaneers on the schedule. So if they win both of those games and continue to win against some of these other teams on their schedule the rest of the way, uh, they can really win the NFC South, which is something that if you would have told me two, three weeks ago, I'd have been like, "You're insane! This team is going down the drain, essentially." Uh, and so, I mean, impressive stuff by the Carolina Panthers. Steve Wilkes is, has them playing, you know, pretty decent ball at this point. So we'll see what happens going forward. The Panthers defense has been stepping it up. So Panthers still in it, baby. All right, next teams. Uh, 49ers versus Buccaneers. This game was disappointing. Uh, for fantasy purposes and all of the above, I just keep spewing it because I'm mad about a fantasy loss I had this week that knocked me out of the playoffs. Uh, but let's get back to the game here. 49ers smoked the uh, the Buccaneers. Buccaneers had nothing for them. Brock Purdy looked incredible again. Uh, I tweeted, I think it was yesterday, that I am more scared of a Brock Purdy-led 49ers offense than I was with a Jimmy G-led offense. And that just comes down to the fact that I think Jimmy G is an accurate passer when everything goes right on a play. Within one second of the snap, if his first or second read is open... He will hit them, and he will be effective that way. When the play starts to go awry, he starts to crap his pants. And I don't think that's something that Brock Purdy has, you know, I don't know. I don't think he does that. He just, he hasn't shown it so far. I mean, it's only been two weeks, so it's early. But I think it's one of those situations where Kyle Shanahan is just telling Brock Purdy what to do, and Brock Purdy is executing exactly what he tells him to do, and that is going to be good enough to make them super scary going into the NFC playoffs. Uh, So as long as he just keeps listening to Coach Shanahan and getting the job done that way, the defense is super good. So, like, really, there's a lot of margin for error. He can still make mistakes, and the defense will cover for him. So moving forward, the 49ers are still, like, very, very competitive. Uh, I If I'm a 49ers fan, I'm hoping Jimmy G's foot takes way longer to heal uh, than – you know, initially expected, you know, people are saying that there's a chance he'd come back for a playoff run. And if I'm a 49ers fan, I'm saying, please stay in rehab because Brock Purdy is getting the job done more effectively than Jimmy G was the entire season. So moving forward, like I said, 49ers problem, Buccaneers kind of stink. Tom Brady didn't have a good game. Uh, Just, I don't know, man. Maybe the Buccaneers hold on to that division, but it looks like the Panthers may have a little bit more momentum going forward. I don't know. That's going to be a weird division going down to the, the last few games of the season. All right, next game, Chargers versus Dolphins. This was the game of the week for me. I was so looking forward to this because of, and I don't even really want to say his name because obviously like that just gives him more, like I don't know, credence or whatever. Emmanuel Acho talking all that straight cash about Tua being better than Herbert. Herbert being a social media QB because of how special his arm is and how many cool throws he can make and blah, 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 but it doesn't, you know, correlate to winning football, blah, 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 blah. Who gives a crap? Dude, we saw it firsthand in this game. (laughs) The Chargers defense took away the middle of the field and Tua started to crap his pants. He had no idea where to go with the ball. That offense is built on throwing the ball over the middle, throwing with timing and anticipation, and the Chargers were dropping their linebackers and safeties right into the holes where Tua wanted to throw the ball, and he was still just letting it rip right where they normally were. So there were so many missed interceptions in this game by the Chargers defenders. 
Uh, but the Chargers stifled that offense. Essentially, like I said, Staley, he did a good job here game planning for you know that two led offense, which was just reading where they like to attack the middle of the field and putting players there, essentially. And Tua did not want to throw outside the numbers, which is going to be a problem going forward if that continues. And throwing outside the numbers is much harder than throwing the pitch and catch stuff over the middle. So uh, this may be a, a slight blueprint to how you beat the Dolphins moving forward. I do have a little bit more confidence in Mike McDaniel of counteracting some of that stuff. We'll just see if Tua can actually execute it, and we will see that moving forward. Uh, obviously, like in this game, Herbert... Had to be a superhero. Offensive line could not protect him at all. And he was just running for his life, running around, throwing absolute piss missiles everywhere. Being a superhero, essentially. Uh, Joe Lombardi is a terrible offensive coordinator. So, I mean, there's just so many things stacked up against Herbert and he still gets the job done. And that's why he is, for sure, like bar none, better than Tua. I mean, it's just, it's very clear. Anybody that has a different opinion of that, I think is is insane. Um, quite frankly, so I'm sorry if that's you, but I think you need to like watch the football games. I mean, it's it's an eye test thing, really. Like it's it's very it's clear as day whenever you're just watching because really the only time Tua makes any impressive throws, everybody's throwing to is open within. I mean, there's five yards of separation between him. Like he doesn't make any tight window throws at all, essentially. So. I just had to get that off my chest. Chargers win the game. They looked impressive in it. Uh, this is the first game Herbert had Mike Williams and Keenan Allen back, and he looked very good here. If the O-line can start holding up a little bit better, um, they're going to be a very tough team moving forward. So we'll see. And that Chargers defense played very, very well, and they're still banged up. So if they start getting more healthy there too, they could be scary for some AFC teams moving forward. So hopefully they get in the playoffs and make a little bit of noise. Last game, Patriots-Cardinals, Monday Night Football. This game was crazy. I really thought the Cardinals were going to win this game. That kind of got shot in the foot when Kyler Murray scrambling, makes a cut, non-contact injury, probably towards ACL. Very unfortunate. That sucks for Kyler. Uh, you never want to see those you know, season-ending type injuries, and that's going to linger in t- deep into next season for him, unfortunately, because of how late this injury is in this season as well. Uh, Patriots end up getting the job done. Ramondre Stevenson actually had to leave this game with an ankle injury. Patriots still ran the ball pretty effectively, and Mac Jones was able to do just enough on offense to you know pass the ball and score some touchdowns there. And I mean, the it sucks. The Cardinal the Cardinals are in a very bad spot right now because of obviously the injury to Kyler. You have Cliff Kingsbury, who if you watch this game at all, there were so many decisions play call-wise and situational-wise that you're thinking, like, what are you even doing? Like, why is this how you're making these – like, how you're making these decisions, I it doesn't make any sense. I just – I don't know what he's doing half the time. So I think he needs to go. Uh, Steve Kime, the GM, I think he needs to go too. He has not had a great uh, last few years drafting for them as well. So – they're in a tight spot. Really, they just need – Cardinals fans just need to pray for Sean Payton uh, to come in and essentially take both of those jobs, head coach and GM. Like, if he could just effectively be both of those, that would be very nice for uh, the Cardinals, and I think he could get it done. Uh, going forward, obviously, the Cardinals are out of playoff contention now, I, I think, especially with the fact that Colt McCoy is going to have to start for the rest of the season. Uh, he still played well. It was, you know, in relief, very sudden that he had to come in and, and – and play, but he just couldn't get the, the job done against the Patriots defense who just had a billion sacks uh, because the Cardinals O-line is terrible. All right, that's pretty much it for the Week 14 recap. Let's get right into week the Week 15 gambling preview and predictions. First game, 49ers minus 3.5 versus the Seahawks. I like the 49ers in this one. 49ers are on a roll. Seahawks are on a losing streak, just an absolute skid. I know it's a division matchup, and those are a little bit closer than normal, but the 49ers are just – on such a roll right now. I know Debo is probably going to be out for this game with that terrible ankle injury. Uh, so hopefully he can get healthy for the playoffs. Um, but yeah, moving forward, I, the 49ers, I don't see a team on their on, left on their schedule where they can't win that game, essentially. So Vikings minus four versus the Colts. Man, the Colts have just been so bad on offense. Their defense is actually pretty decent. 
Uh, I just don't trust their offense in Matt Ryan whatsoever. So I'm going to go Vikings minus four here. Browns minus three versus the Ravens. I got to go Browns just because I'm I'm a little bit worried about what the Ravens QB situation is going to look like with you know the injury, obviously, to Lamar Jackson and then Tyler Huntley getting hurt in that game. So I don't know who's going to end up starting for them. Uh, the Browns are starting to figure out a few things on offense with Deshaun Watson getting a little bit more play time. So I think I'm going to go with Browns minus three in this one. Bills minus seven and a half versus the Dolphins. This is something I read after the fact. So the Dolphins played in LA in a dome, you know, with versus the Chargers, and they brought, or I don't know if they brought, but they, yeah, I guess they brought them. They brought heaters in to go near the benches. This is an indoor stadium where the temperature was around the mid 50s. The, the Dolphins are so soft, dude. I mean, I don't know. I <laughs> I can't stand that, man. Like between just Tua and I, I sound like such a hater, and I really am. I'm not even on front. I just I'm just not a huge Tua guy. And just the, the Dolphins bringing heaters to an indoor stadium in Los Angeles when the 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 temperatures are in the mid 50s is the softest thing I've heard in football in a long time. Like I know you're from Miami, your place. You know you're used to playing in the heat, but dang man, like that is just. And then next week or this week, obviously Bills Dolphins. It's in Buffalo. It's gonna be freezing. Like it's gonna be super cold. Like I wouldn't doubt if it's in the teens at the very least. So I'm going Bills minus seven and a half. I, I I tweeted it out like after I saw the the heater news that I was like, man, I don't even care what the line is. I'm going Buffalo. Buffalo is gonna steamroll these guys. The you know the Chargers pretty much put the blueprint out there for the the Dolphins offense how to stop it. And if you can just you know, keep those guys contained between Waddle and Hill, you're fine. I mean, that offense is not very scary. Uh, Raheem Mostert seems to be declining before our eyes a little bit. Uh, Jeff Wilson have, had to leave the game. And I just, man, I, I like the Bills in this matchup, minus 7.5. Eagles, minus 8.5 versus the Bears. This is in Chicago. This is the second game of a three-game road trip for the Eagles. Uh, they played, obviously, last week against the Giants in New York. So they got the Chicago Bears in Chicago this week and the next week in Dallas on Christmas Eve. This week, this is a classic trap game. Uh, I don't think the Eagles are going to let it be a trap game, but this is like the definition of you coming off of a emotional, huge blowout against uh, the a division rival in the Giants. Then you got this bad Bears team where Justin Fields can be a wild card. You never know what he can do. He can make some plays with his feet. So that's going to be concerning. Uh, but their defense is basically non-existent. And then you obviously have the next game against, you know, the division rival. Basically, that's going to decide the the future of the number one seed in the NFC against the Cowboys on Christmas Eve. So that's like the classic look ahead game. You're looking towards that, not really looking at the team right in front of you who is not a very good team. I just have faith in Justin, Justin, in Jalen Hurts that he's the type of leader. I think Nick Sirianni is, Nick Sirianni is the type of head coach that's not going to let a trap game happen and affect them. So I think the Eagles still cover here. Bears are just too bad of a football team. The Eagles are just too good. So I'm going to go with the Eagles, minus 8.5 here. Cowboys, minus 4.5 versus the Jags. Maybe th this may be me being biased. This just may be all of it on display. But i got to go Jaguars and the points here. Jaguars have looked good. Trevor Lawrence has been slinging the football. They have weapons. They have Travis Etienne, uh, obviously Christian Kirk, Zay Jones, Marvin Jones, I mean, they have some weapons, and the defense is playing a little bit better than people, ex you know, expected them to. They got some pass rushers over there in Jacksonville, so I think it's going to be another competitive game. The Cowboys look terrible against the Texans. They really just let them hang around in that game, and they almost lost it, uh, and the Jaguars are a much, much better team than the Texans, so I think it's going to be close. Cowboys are probably going to end up winning that game, but I don't think it's by a whole lot, so that's why I'm going to go with the Jaguars and the four and a half points there. Chiefs, minus 14 versus Texans. Got to go Chiefs. I know the Texans were competitive against the Cowboys. It's not going to happen a second week in a row. T Kansas City is going to look at that tape and say, oh, this is what they do good, or this is what they do well. This is what they did well against the Cowboys. Let's fix that. Let's nip that right in the bud, and the Chiefs are going to roll for sure. Uh, Chiefs are probably going to have an incredible running game. So if you have 
Uh, Isaiah Pacheco or Jarek McKinnon in fantasy, start them. Unless you just have some crazy studs in your lineup. Next game, Lions minus one versus the Jets. This is essentially a pick em game. I am going to go with the Lions. It's at home in New York. Uh, the only reason I'm going Lions here, because I really like the Jets defense, and I really like the weaponry on the Jets. Uh, the Lions are super hot right now. The defense is playing pretty well. Offense is playing out of their mind. Really, the only reason I'm picking the Lions here is because I don't know what the status of Mike White is. If Mike White play, plays in this game, I'm probably more willing to jump on the Jets bandwagon here. But if it's Joe Flacco, he just holds the ball way too long. And that pass rush is getting better for the Lions. So there could be a lot of sacks and potential strip sacks. So I don't like that looking at it from right now. But if Mike White's in there, my mind may change on this one. But for the time being, Lions. Panthers, minus two versus the Steelers. I think the Panthers are on a little bit of a roll here. They got some momentum. They've won their last two games. They now you know, realize they control their own destiny. They can go and win the NFC South if they just continue to win these football games. So I think they're going to be very motivated. The Steelers, I don't know what's going to happen because Kenny Pickett has a concussion. Mitch Trubisky got in there and made some very bad decisions through some picks. So I think the Panthers win this game uh, and cover, obviously. Saints minus four and a half versus the Falcons. I don't really have a good feel for this game. I'm not going to lie. I think Desmond Ritter is going to start for the Falcons now, which is interesting. Uh, I don't know. We just don't know what to expect from him as a starter in the league yet because he hasn't done it. But the Falcons kind of always have the Saints number for whatever reason. So I'm going to go with the Falcons and the points here. I think they, at the very least, cover and they may end up winning this football game. And I really hope they do based on the fact the Eagles own the Saints draft pick. And right now it is number four overall in the draft order. So that is going to be sweet. I mean, can you imagine Jalen Carter in an Eagles uniform beside Jordan Davis? Holy cow. I'm excited. Okay. Patriots minus one versus the Raiders. I think I have to go Patriots here. Uh, you're probably thinking, oh, why would you like go on that so fast? Blah, blah, blah. It's really just the teacher versus the student. It's Bill Belichick versus Josh McDaniel. Bill Belichick knows every single thing that Josh McDaniel likes to do. So it's just one of those things where I think he's going to be one step ahead uh, and the, the Patriots will get the job done somehow on offense just because they, I don't know, they just will. I mean, and there's nothing about that offense that really gives me that much confidence, but the Raiders' defense is just bad enough to to make me confident that Mac Jones can make some throws. Next game, Broncos minus 2.5 versus the Cardinals. I know, obviously, Kyler Murray is not going to play in this game towards ACL, I think. We haven't got the full report yet, of course, but I think I'm going to go the Cardinals here. The Cardinals and the points. Uh, Colt McCoy is a good enough QB to get things done. Uh, the Cardinals have weapons still. I mean, they have Marquise Brown. They have D-Hop. Uh, Trey McBride made some plays on Monday Night Football. They still have James Conner, who's a very, very good running back. Uh, so I think they can get it done here. Uh, Bengals, minus three and a half versus the Buccaneers. I'm going to go Bengals here. Bengals are on a, on a little bit of a heater. Joe Burrow is playing incredible. We'll see what the health of some of their wide receivers are going to be going forward. If they just have Jamar Chase, it's going to be a little bit harder to do. But, I mean, that Buccaneers team has looked so bad the last couple of weeks. I know they squeezed one out against the Saints, but this past week against the 49ers was just very ugly. Uh, so I'm going, to, I'm going to have to go Bengals here. They're still hot, and I think they're going to continue to be hot. And Joe Burrow is playing out of his mind right now. Chargers minus two and a half versus the Titans. Uh, Titans have scarred me a couple times here trying to bet on them with the spread. And I really, man, this is such a hard decision because the Chargers have played so well this past uh, Sunday night. But, man, I, I know the Chargers, you can still really run on them. And we still haven't seen enough games with Keenan Allen and Mike Williams in the lineup. So that makes me hesitant. And then the Titans, they probably get Traylon Burks back. And that offense is much better when they have a little bit more weaponry, obviously. And they can, can stay balanced with their offense and Derrick Henry running the ball. I just, I guess I'm going, I'm going to go Titans here. This is just for now. I think things may change by the end of the week when I probably do my, you know, full-blown gambling predictions. But for the time being, I'll go Titans and the points. Uh, I think it's going to be close. Commanders minus four and a half versus the Giants. I think I'm going to go Giants here. Uh, the Giants are going to be pretty upset that they got absolutely smoked and rolled by the Eagles. And I think that they're going to, I know they tied the last time they played these two teams. 
I think the Commanders are probably the better team of the two. I just have a weird feeling the Giants are going to come back and strike back and Saquon Barkley is going to have a good game. That's going to piss me off because I'm playing a guy in the playoffs right now, in the fantasy playoffs, that has Saquon, and I can just see him going off and just destroying my fantasy hopes and dreams. But, yeah, uh, I just have a weird feeling about the Giants in this one. Packers, minus seven versus the Rams. I want to pick that, like, I think everybody's going to jump on the Rams bandwagon quickly because of Baker Mayfield. And I think that's that's a kind of a, a mistake, but not a much as much of a mistake as, as the point spread here. I think the Rams stay competitive in this one, and they cover the seven-point spread. The Packers, I think, still win the football game, So, and it's in Lambeau. Uh, I, just, I think the Packers will win, but it'll be a close one. It'll probably be a field goal type game. So I'll go Packers in that one with the points. All right, guys, so that wraps it up for this episode of Coordinated Chaos. I appreciate you guys tuning in. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, subscribe to our you know, Twitter account, our Instagram. Uh, we post on all that stuff. We post on YouTube, obviously, and TikTok and all that crap. So that's going to be pretty fun going forward. Looking forward to the playoffs here. And once again, I appreciate my guy Weston for editing this podcast. He's the man, and we will talk to you next week. See ya.